Here's a video I found by Capturing Christianity called Don't Believe in Demons? Watch this! Okay, why? Is this video going to convince me that demons exist? That seems to be heavily implied. All right, let's see what this video says. So I think a lot of people are, are probably, at least the people that are watching this stream right now, a lot of you are skeptical about demon possession and about demons in general. How would you convince somebody or what, what would you say to somebody who's just skeptical about the whole thing? Like maybe you're just making these stories up to, to get attention. Yeah. Well, it depends on the, where one begins. You know, if you're a person of faith, believing is seeing. If you don't really have that faith, then you say seeing is believing. So it's coming at it from two different angles. But again, the basis I would have is what the church has consistently taught throughout you know, the church's 2,000-year-old history is that evil is something personified in what we call the devil and these other fallen angels. You know, evil is not just humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. It's not just something of our own making, but there is something personified in evil, again, that we call the devil and evil spirits. And the church has consistently taught that throughout her history, and it's backed up by sacred scripture. So, so far, he says the basis for believing in demons is, one, the church says they're real, and two, the Bible says they're real. Wow, I'm starting to be convinced already. Well, then tell me tell me another, uh, so, so you've been part of some exorcisms that when when these people are possessed and the, well, it's really the demon, if, if, if there is such a thing as demon possession, it's the demons that are doing these sort of supernatural things. And the four criteria that you mentioned, what's an example of someone explicitly exemplifying or a demon exemplifying one of those one of those things, supernatural uh, knowledge or power or knowing some language or even levitating? I've seen stories about levitation. Give, mm -hmm. Tell me a, some, some of these stories that you've seen personally. Well, it's important to know that a demon can act on a person's memory and imagination. So the real challenge is when these manifestations begin, the demon is really working on the mind of those who are there, the memory and imagination. So are these things truly happening, or is the demon causing myself and others to believe that what we see is real? Which again is why exorcists are trained not to focus on these things. It would be nice if they were trained to question their own religious biases and underlying assumptions, but I guess that's asking too much. But you're right, some of the examples of manifestations, we mentioned a few. Eyes rolled in the back of the head, foaming at the mouth, exhibiting superhuman strength. I've seen demons manifest and pick up items like a, a metal swivel desk chair with just one hand lifted over their head. The person that did this didn't even weigh 100 pounds. None of this sounds supernatural so far. A swivel desk chair? If it were a whole desk, I'd be impressed, but a desk chair being thrown even by a small person on an adrenaline rush doesn't seem very supernatural to me. Speaking languages otherwise unknown, speaking in Latin or in ancient Greek. Lots of Latin and Greek phrases are common knowledge among English speakers, and especially so among Christians who've put some study into their religion. So demonic possession is not the simplest explanation for that. I imagine even lay Catholics have knowledge of several Latin words that most other folks don't know. Even simply mishearing what sounds like Latin or Greek words is a far more likely explanation than demons trying to scare you. Uh, other examples would be um, slithering on the ground like a snake. Again, all of these things are meant to instill fear. I personally witnessed someone levitate. I don't think this dude is lying, but I do think he has a strong aversion to applying Occam's razor in these kinds of circumstances. People have shared stories about once the demon manifests, it crawls up the wall like a spider. So again, these things are all meant to instill fear. And one of the things you said is very important. The distinction must always be made between the person as an individual, and the actions now of the demon once they've taken over the person's body, treating that body as if it were its own. So exorcists are trained to make the distinction between the person as someone created in the image and likeness of God, and now the demon that is treating that body as if it were its own. Let's talk about the 
the philosophy behind demon possession. How how can something like that be possible? How can a spiritual being take over a physical being and make them do things? That's a good question that I would apply to the idea of the soul. If we are really souls inhabiting bodies, how do those immaterial souls exert control over material bodies? If ghosts can walk through walls, how can they seem to take a firm grasp of our physical brains? If you can't touch the soul, how can souls touch us? How is that possible? Well, nothing happens in the demonic world that God does not permit. And that's true of all reality. You know, God permits many things to happen. Doesn't mean that that's... God desires them to happen, but God does permit things to happen. So why would a demon be interested in possessing a human body? And the answer is, is at the very core of Christianity. The greatest thing that God ever did for us is the incarnation, took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. So the devil or some other demon who wishes to mimic God in each and every way believes that he takes on human form by possessing a human body. I think he's missing the point of the question. This is an explanation of why demons would be motivated to possess someone, when the question seemed to be about the mechanics of how a demon accomplishes this. And when they possess the human body, it's using the person's voice to speak, their hands to give gestures, their feet to walk. Gee, it's almost exactly like the possessed person is doing this all on their own. But again, once the demon takes over, then all of the actions are now wholly defined by the demon itself. So, well, the question is, how does that happen? How can a spiritual being like a demon actually take possession over somebody and make them do things? Like, is it, do they implant themselves in, in the soul? Is it the, like, is it neurons that they're fiddling with? What, what is that actually, ha what, what is happening? It's not in the soul. There can be no actual connection between a human soul and a, uh, and a demon. So it's always of a physical nature. What does that mean? Is he saying that demons are physical? In what sense is a demonic possession of a physical nature? And that comes about, goes back to what we touched on earlier, is someone is creating an entry point whereby they are, are inviting a demon into their life. You know, a, a, so, a demon, as a pure spiritual creature, doesn't occupy time and space as we do, you know, you're in a room right now, I'm in a room, the room is containing us. A spirit isn't contained by space, it contains the space. How can something contain anything without itself being spatial? Now that can kind of give you a headache to think about it for a moment, but as a pure spirit with intellect and will is not contained by space, it contains the space. So when one chooses to open up an entry point to evil into their life, it literally is that now the evil spirit is containing them. Wait, if a possessed person invites the demon into their life, how is it that the demon is the one containing the possessed person? Wouldn't it be clear to say that the possessed person opened an entry point in the demon and then stepped inside if the demon is the one containing the space? They've either pushed God away and invited the demon now to uh, contain them, and that's how the manifestations then will begin and take place. So it's a physical, so it's a, an analogy I was thinking about was it'd be like a, a demon coming in and like pushing the person out of the driver's seat into the passenger seat. And then the demon sits in the driver's seat and starts driving the, the car, so to speak. And the car is the analogy of the body, something like that. Yeah. Yes. Well, in that case, the body is still containing the demon, not the other way around. And when that happens, people I work with, some are fully aware of what's taking place, but they feel as if they're a prisoner trapped in their own body. Uh, they're incapable of stopping what's taking place. Other people I've worked with have told me that once the demon took over, they lose all recollection of what was taking place. Let's think about some other natural explanations of what could have happened in these cases. So when you, you mentioned levitation, what could have been happening there that is not supernatural? Do you know what I mean? So like, go ahead. I was going to say it could have been just something that I believe that I was seeing because at the time the person was shaking very violently and then I saw them rise up out of the chair. Don't you think it's a simpler explanation just to infer that they shook themselves out of the chair? Why would that not be your first inference? And then that's when the priest reached over and put his hand on the head of the person and pushed them back in the chair. Now there was another priest in the room 
and we talked about it later, but he didn't see it. Wow. I got to tell you, the more I hear this guy talk, the more convinced I become that demons are a thing. So I saw it. He didn't. Obviously, the priest doing the exorcism witnessed something to reach over and push the person back down into the chair by putting their hand on their head. What about the, okay. the one where the, the person grabbed the table, the steel table, and raised it above their head with one hand? Yeah, well, again, were, that's Were you the only I, one there? That was the, uh, no, there, I would never do an exorcism alone. Okay. So there's always other people that are present. Certainly myself, I will have somebody else with me, and then the person that's possessed, and then a family member or friend. So it's, it's never a one-on-one -on -one setting. And so there were other people in the room that saw this person grab this table above their head. Yes. Yep. Wait a minute. Was it a table or was it a swivel desk chair? I've seen demons manifest and pick up items like a, a metal swivel desk chair. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. And there was no way they could have done that on their own volition. Not from the, uh, the physical capacity of the person. It would have just been impossible. Unless I guess you could say that their adrenaline was just on such a rush and a high that at that moment they just were able to do something beyond their normal human capacity. Why would that not be your first inference? Why go straight to assuming a demon is responsible? Everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.